Good evening, everyone. It is 5.30 on our dot. How's everyone doing tonight? All right, all right. So, so that we're respectful of everyone's time, we're gonna get started. Um, boss, is there someone, can we do the introduction for the translator for those that may need it? Sure. Uh, buenas noches a todos. Uh, si hay alguien en el comité, uh, Oh, Ms. Valle, you're here. Are you our translator for tonight? Uh, well, you know what? Let me, you'll do a much better job than I. So why don't you go ahead and uh, and announce that and, and make that available? She is already in the Oh, she's room. already in the room. Okay. Um, okay, si hay alguien en el comité que necesita uh, traducción o si hay alguien uh, en el Zoom uh, participando uh, y quiero oír lo que está pasando lo quiero lo quiere oír en español uh, abajo de su pantalla uh, hay una oportunidad donde puede uh, elegir uh, oír esta esta junta en español nada más abajo uh, es parece como un a una representación del, del mundo, ahí uh, uh, haga clic y luego elija Spanish y ahí puede uh, participar en esta junta uh, en español. Gracias. Thank you. Okay, so first, welcome everyone tonight. This is our second meeting. Um, I hope you all did receive the email with the PowerPoint presentation, so that way you can follow along with us. So I will get started. So here, um, our objective tonight, um, this evening, is to revisit the why behind the um, reorganization and for everyone to gain an understanding of the model. At this time, we do not want to get stuck on the who, what, when, or why. Um, that will take place at a later meeting. But right now, we want everyone to gain an understanding of the model, how the model was implemented, um, the possible pro um, programmatic drawbacks and benefits, the support staff for the proposed model and any potential budgetary impacts for the model. We will commit a later session at a later time so that we can have input on pros and cons, opinions, objectives, and maybe another model implementation that someone wants to throw out. But right now we're gonna focus on our objective today and understanding model one. So here, let's just start back with the why behind the reorganization. As we discussed in our first meeting during the 0203 school year, we only had 20% of our facilities unoccupied district-wide. Fast forward to today, in our current school year, we have over 50% of our facilities unoccupied district-wide. And that trend continues over the next four subsequent years. So here, as we shared in our last meeting, this is all of our elementary schools going across the top down to the right. It gives you their projected enrollment for each year, as well as the current open seats, as well as the percentage of current open seats based off the current projection of enrollment. This is actually the same thing for our middle school, having Center, Foothill and Slauson, same thing, capacity, projected enrollment, number of open seats and the percentage of open seats. Same thing following suit with our two high school, Gladstone and Azusa High School, capacity projection, number of open seats and percentage of open seats. 
Now, we as, con as we continue this journey and move forward and looking in depth of model one, we want to remember our goal. We want to focus on getting the understanding of the model. At this time, we don't want to get focused on the who, the what, the why. Again, we're going to address that at a later meeting. Right now, we want to focus on understanding the model, how the model is going to be implemented over the next five years, the possible um, programmatic drawbacks and benefits, the support staff that will be implemented to support the new model, the projected model, and any potential budgetary impacts listed that are tied to this model. Now we are going to unveil model one, the all level model. So under the all level model, we would have one traditional elementary, TK5, one traditional middle school, six through eight, four TK8, and two traditional high schools. Here is a graph or a chart that shows you how we would implement the plan. So under this model, we would have six schools that would eventually close. So under the, um, for, I'm sorry, for the 21-22 school year, there will be no new enrollment to those schools that would be listed to be closed. So that would be school one, two, three, four, five, and six. So for the 21-22 school year, they will have grades one through six. Going moving forward to the 22 to the 23 school year, TK and grades two will transition to one of the new schools under the model, proposed model, and grades three through six will remain at the current home school. And this will continue in that trajectory until we um, fast forward to fiscal year 25-26, where we will have fifth grade will be the last grade to transition to the new schools, and the home school will maintain the sixth grade class so they can graduate from their home school if that's their preference. Then looking at it in the same way of how the new schools will be implemented. Um, during the 21-22 school year, school one would have TK6, school two will have seven and eight, school three, TK through eight, school four, TK through seven, school five, TK, um, TK kinder plus seventh and eighth, school six, TK kinder plus seventh and eighth. If you go to the 22 two school year, this is when the first transition of TK and two would start going to the new schools. So school one would have TK six, school two would have seven, eight, school three would have TK eight, school four, TK eight, school five, TK two, seventh and eighth, school six, the exact same thing. And what's interesting about school two, school two has a seventh and eighth because that would be the traditional middle school. Going to um, school year 23, 24, you would have TK6. School two, again, seven, eight, TK8, TK8. Now you'll have TK3 and grade seven and eight for the remaining fifth and sixth school. Going to school year 24, 25, the exact same format where you'll have the TK6, seventh, eighth, TK8, TK8, but now you'll have TK4 um, and grade seven and eight at school five and six. And then in the 25, 26 school year will be the last year of the five-year implementation plan. You will have TK six, seventh, eight, seven, TK eight, TK eight, now TK five, seven and eight. If the enrollment support, so let's just say a, a family says, you know what, I just wanna jump and I wanna go right into it in the 22-22 school year. And I don't wanna wait until the third graders are moving to the new school. If the enrollment would support the class size based off our current class size, and um, we can support it with the teacher, that option will be on the table. So here, this is giving us an overall look if we were saying, okay, what would our grades TK-8 look like for Azusa Unified School District under Model 1? We would have one traditional TK-5 school. We would have one traditional middle school, grades 6 through 8, and we would have four TK-8 schools. Tasha. Yes. Can you go back two slides? Two, one. Right two. here. Uh, no, the next one. Sorry. Uh, just to point out, um, right now, this is a five-year plan. 
right? So what you don't see is 2627. So if you toggle really quick to the next slide, and then we're going to come right back to this one. When you look at this slide right here, you say to yourself, wait a minute, there's a TK5 and there's a 68. But when I go back up, you see that there is no TK5 and no 68. That's because this five year plan doesn't get us to the sixth year. If we were to continue this in 26, 27, new school one, that's when it becomes a TK5. New school two, that's when it becomes a 68. And then school three and school four, that's when they become legitimate full blown TK eights. So because it's a five year plan, that's why you see that. So you kind of have to stretch your imagination to that six column to actually see the grand finale, if you will. Yes. And just to um, reiterate the reason why um, we did over five years is so that way the students that are currently at those home schools, there will be no immediate impact. They can choose to say, hey, I'm at my school. I want to graduate from there. If their school is currently a TK6, they would have that option. All right. And so now we are going to turn it over to Dr. Mitchell. Hello, everyone. So um, we are going to take a look at uh, this model and what programs might look like at each of the schools within this model. So when you take a look at it, you can see all of the six schools and some programmatic elements. Uh, one of the things would be um, special education. There would be, uh, we would continue to offer a continuum of special education services throughout the sites. We would continue to offer preschool at all of our TK5, TK8 sites, uh, not at the 6-8. Um, the, uh, we are, uh, we host the, uh, visually impaired program for our SELPA. And so that program would be at the, um, T at a TK eight site school six. And then also in terms of dual immersion, um, currently we have, uh, two schools that, uh, have a dual immersion program. We would continue to have that one would be at the TK five and one would be at the TK eight. Then additionally, beyond the core curricular program, there are other programs to consider as well. Um, one of the, um, one of the um, possible options here would be at the 6-8 middle school. Uh, they would offer, they would continue to offer uh, what's what's usually referred to as a year long um, traditional elective course. And typically these are um, they're VAPA, visual and performing arts, STEM, art, media arts. Um, we have Spanish, AVID. And so they would, uh, this school would continue to offer these year long elective courses. These elective courses for the middle school is dependent upon student enrollment as well as interest as well. Uh, taking a look at what would electives look like in a TK-5 and the TK-8 model. So uh, in this proposed model, although they don't typically have these traditional bi-period uh, elective uh, classes, this model proposes that all students would have an opportunity to participate in elective type activities, um, including visual and performing arts, so uh, band and vocal. Um, in addition, students would have an opportunity to participate in STEM activities, which could include coding, um, robotics, makerspace. And so in this, uh, in this model, um, students could have an opportunity to participate in kind of a wheel where they'd have an opportunity to try all the different um, you know, elective activities. 
Another option to that in this proposed model might be that a school has perhaps has kind of what they call a magnet, which is a specialty focus, for example, like art or STEM. So that's what that would look like for a TK5 um, and TK8 in terms of elective um, activities or offerings. Um, our students uh, in all, uh, all of these different offerings in this model still have an opportunity to participate in uh, parks and recreation through our city. They have lots of different um, activities after school, um, so students could participate in that. Um, in terms of after school sports, uh, in the 6 8 and the TK. Eight uh, is an opportunity for students to participate in after school sports. Uh, Think Together would still be offered at all of our sites. Uh, Before Care School in all of our sites except for the middle school. Um, and then the last one would be um, peer mediation. And this is something that we have, uh, we started last year. Um, peer mediation and restorative practices um, is something that we will be um, engaged in a partnership with um, the Western Justice Center. Um, and that's gonna be for all of our sites. So we would continue to do that as well. So with any model, there's always going to be potential programmatic drawbacks and um, uh, programmatic, um, you know, potentials, right? And so let's talk a little bit about um, some of the possible potential programmatic drawbacks with this particular model. This particular model does not address declining enrollment at high schools. And so when we have declining enrollment at the high schools, that could uh, that could, um, you know, be a result in the loss or reduction of electives or programs. You don't have as many teachers, and there might be fewer opportunities for um, for sports or activities or or clubs, right? Due to that declining enrollment. Also, um, smaller sixth through eighth grade student cohorts at the TK-8 model. Uh, these are uh, self-contained classes. Uh, so typically you have uh, one teacher, who, a multiple subject teacher who is teaching uh, that particular class, which is a grade level. And again, that particular model with the TK-8 does not have the traditional um, electives like a 6-8 does. And uh, this uh, a potential uh, programmatic drawback could be smaller staff teams. Elementary, uh, uh, the elementary model does require uh, fewer PE minutes. Uh, Self-contained eighth grade students would transition directly to high school. Another potential uh, programmatic drawback is closing sites that could uh, may have already had some modernization. And then um, the last thing to think about too might be that with the different models, there could be some possible confusion on the student enrollment process. And because there are different options, where do people go? How do you, you know, how do you register? Um, so those could be some potential programmatic drawbacks. Now there are some potential programmatic benefits. One would be parent choice. You have the traditional elementary, the TK-8, a traditional 6-8 middle school. When another one is when you have larger elementary schools, that could mean fewer combination classes. Another one is in a TK-8 school. Uh, the students are there for all of those grade levels and then change schools at high school. And so you have less, uh, you have consistency in a learning location. So you don't have students essentially move um, two more times when they, get to, when they get to high school or change schools. A larger enrollment at a six, eight school does create more opportunity for additional elective options and programs for students. Increasing student population at a school site does increase collaboration for uh, programs, for teachers, for staff, for professional learning communities, um, for um, parent learning networks, parent groups. Um, so that's a, that could be a potential programmatic benefit as well. Um, another one would be an opportunity for this idea of this elective wheel at a TK-6 or a TK-8 um, where students get an opportunity to try different things uh, and maybe rotate through. Or again, it could be that magnet specialty focus like arts, for example. 
Another programmatic benefit, class sizes would remain the same. Um, and then another one might be the fact that this is a five-year gradual transition. Hello, everyone. I um, hope everyone's doing well. I am going to talk about the um, piece that um, the committee wanted to um, go deeper into in their um, of analysis of the different models that involve support staff. Um, as we talk about support staff um, in the next slides, it's important to understand that these uh, projections describe uh, reductions and or eliminations of positions. These are not easy decisions to arrive at, and we take them with all great seriousness. Uh, we understand that some of these decisions cannot be made unilaterally um, and will require negotiations. Um, the slide before you aims to establish a staffing formula for support staff to create an equitable floor. And I will be referring to this um, throughout the next couple of slides. Uh, one of the positions that you see um, and we'll discuss as well is a new position on uh, position of social welfare, SW professional, that uh, we believe that in these days and times is very, very needed. Um, so um, that's something that we could, we could um, uh, you'll be seeing in, in the next couple of slides. Um, you, so we're, we're trying to establish a floor. So um, when it comes to sites, as we move into this new model, sites with seventh and eighth grade students, um, they will all have at least 0.5 of a um, of a um, assistant principal. That 0.5 means that um, that uh, t that uh, principal will be uh, shared at a separate site. So that's what that uh, 0.5 means. Um, and then um, if at the point of the increased uh, enrollment, the site um, experiences an increase in enrollment that exceeds 750 students. Um, then that will grow to one full-time assistant principal. I want to make sure that we have a shared understanding of what that enrollment date actually um, is uh, that we're looking at. That enrollment date is will be the uh, seabed enrollment date. That is a uh, defined day in the calendar. That's actually the first Wednesday of October where the, uh, we establish the enrollment for that school. Um, and that is what we will be using for the subsequent year to determine if we are exceeding the, these numbers to uh, require additional staffing. Uh, moving on to counselors, um, every site with the seventh and eighth grade uh, will have at least a 0.5 counselor. Um, and again, if the enrollment on CBEDS date exceeds 750, that number will go, that will go up to a full-time counselor. And like I stated earlier, um, the social work position, which is new, um, similarly, every uh, seventh and eighth grade site will have at least a 0.5 social worker. Um, and if the enrollment increases to 750 students or more on CBEDS day of the year before, that will go to a full-time social worker. Uh, community liaisons is another uh, support staff position we looked at. Um, the, the schools that we will be talking about in the next couple slides have to do with TK-8 uh, configurations. Um, and so the uh, at, at a base, all the sites will have at least a four hour community liaison position. And similarly, if the enrollment on CBEDS date the year before uh, exceed 750, then they will increase to uh, by two hours to a six hour uh, community liaison. I wanna make sure that that's, that's clear. Um, and then for library aids, the floor will be all sites in the TK8 configuration will have a four hour library aid. Um, and then that, uh, that will increase to six hours um, if the uh, enrollment exceeds 750. Um, for uh, school clerk, the base will be all sites will have an eight hour position. Um, and if the enrollment increases, they um, may have an, an additional person not to exceed four hours. 
so that the site does not exceed more than 1.5 of this support service. Um, Tasha? So you'll see in this first uh, uh, year of implementation, the 21-22, uh, it will be a status quo um, that, uh, as it applies to support staff, meaning that there will not be any um, increases or reductions even as we start in the first year of the implementation. Uh, this is um, this. So for I, I, I know that we um, have seventh and eighth grade positions. I'm sorry, seventh and eighth grade middle schools with a full-time counselor position. That would be that would remain the status quo in this year. So, Latasha. Yes, and the one budgetary impact that we realize is that for schools five and six, if they currently do not have a kinder class, we would have to modernize to make sure they have the proper restrooms and classrooms set up to um, support a kindergarten classroom, including the playground. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be talking about the top half of the um, table that you see here with the schools one, two, um, uh, four, five, three, and six. Um, you, those are going to be the schools that I'll refer to as where as they will be phasing out. Um, you will not see any changes in in staffing uh, for this um, school year. However, if you look below, um, the new schools that are are listed below will have um, a a change in um, in staffing um, in alignment with. Uh, the staffing formula that I shared earlier, uh, wherein um, there will be a uh, reduction of a 0.5 counselor at the school two, at school five, and at school six. Um, and the 0.5 social worker will now appear at those same sites um, as, as, we're, as it's reflected on, the, on this site right um, uh, on this slide. The um, TK8 uh, currently, um, they, they, they will only, or I'm sorry, that in that 22, 23 year, they will be getting a 0.5 of, an, of a social worker. And so in, for school three, since that is adding to the current FTE, that's why we're projecting at least a $70,000 increase for um, salary and benefits for that position. All right, so this is uh, where we start getting um, into some some more detailed level positions. So I'm going to try to go through this um, in pieces. Um, so in previously in each of the phase, uh, each of the years that you saw earlier that I've been discussing, um, each of those schools in the phase out schools, uh, one, two, three, four, five, and six schools above, uh, they all had going into this year a full-time resource teacher. Um, but beginning in the 23-24 school year, um, at the schools being phased out with fourth and fifth grade students um, at their sites, uh, you, you will now see three uh, resource teachers sharing these six schools. Uh, the uh, positions of health assistant, um, and also um, the library aides uh, position will also be reduced by a hour, uh, by uh, 1.5 hours of, of work for that day, for, uh, for, for each of those schools. Below on the 2023-2024, um, you'll see that the, um, the resource teachers will be um, added to schools five and six, and the, um, uh, the health assistant will be, um, um, will be at each of the schools and the new schools below. So they'll see them on one, two, three, uh, four, uh, five, and six. Um, the library aides, uh, they, there will also be um, uh, there, there's going to be a, a reduction in, in library aids, um, and, and you'll see that uh, for uh, school two, school three, 
and school, I'm sorry, school uh, two, school five, and school six. Um, however, um, there will be an increase in, in the library uh, aids hours and school number three and school number four. And then lastly, um, there's a school clerk position that's also uh, listed here. Uh, the school clerk positions will be reduced in schools one, two, five, and six in accordance to the staffing formula that I shared earlier. Ms. Latasha? No. Uh, the 24-25 uh, year, um, there will not be any staffing changes. Uh, so the staffing changes that I described in the previous slide will continue through, um, through the 24-25 school year. And then finally, the 25-26 year, uh, the uh, 0.17 FTE reduction of the resource teacher is essentially uh, reducing the number of uh, resource teachers to two that will service the um, six schools for the one grade level of sixth grade. Um, and then both the, um, the health assistant and library assistant positions will be reduced to one hour at these sites. Okay, so now before we move on to the next slide of identifying the three models, we wanted to make sure we understand model one. We've shown you what the model was. We've shown you how the model will be implemented over the next five years. Um, we've discussed the potential programmatic drawbacks potential programmatic benefits, um, proposed support um, staff, as well as those um, changes that would have budgetary impact. So here is a listing of all three models that we would essentially be discussing. Again, we presented model one today, which is one traditional elementary school TK-5, one traditional middle, six through eight, four TK-8, and two traditional high school. Model two that we will discuss at our next meeting will have, I'm sorry, will have TK-8 and high school. It will have five TK-8 and two traditional high school. Model three will be a mo all model level 2.0, which would have five traditional elementary schools, TK-5, two traditional middle schools, grades six through eight, one traditional TK and two traditional high school. And it's important to note that all of the models, model one, two, or three can also be considered with only having one traditional high school. So before I go to the next slide to identify goals of our next meeting, um, we can open up for questions, but with understanding that our goal tonight is to gain an understanding of the model, the six pieces that we agreed upon, which was the model type, how the model will be implemented, the program, um, possible programmatic um, drawbacks, possible um, programmatic benefits, support staff, and any potential budgetary impact. Those were the six pieces that we agreed upon. And so now in order to make sure you understand Model one, are there any questions based on what we presented tonight that, uh, I that was identified in the six pieces? Yes, I do. I think as part of some of the uh, drawbacks to this model, you need to point out that you'd be losing a, a teachers whose expertise in, is in a particular subject area. You are now gonna have a uh, it, one eighth grade teacher teach five subject areas, whereas the kids are now used to specialized teachers for those particular subjects. I, okay. I would add that as a drawback. Okay, thank you. So why are they changing it back to six, eight model when we just put the sixth graders back at the elementary level? Well, this is just a model, and this is just an okay. opportunity to have a traditional elementary with a traditional middle. 
do you want us to put our name in the chat or do you want us to type our question in the chat or should we just kind of talk out um, a little? Um, I will leave that up to the team because I personally can't see the chat right now since I'm sharing my screen. So okay. I will need assistance on that and I'm sorry. Okay, uh, question, I want clarification on two things. Um, one, um, with these uh, model one for TK through eight schools, I think I, I heard the assumption is that all of the classes are gonna be self-contained. And so in doing that, the children that are in seventh and eighth grade will not switch at all. They will stay with one teacher all day in a self-contained classroom. That's in the first. current TK-8 model, correct. In the current TK-8 model, okay. Because I wanna make sure that parents understand what that means too, that there will be no switching of, of classes in the sense of in the traditional sense that we have now. But we so, do have a traditional middle school. If that's a desire, you can go to the traditional well, middle school. I hear school. you, I'm, I'm saying in the TK through eight, they're gonna oh, be okay. self-contained seventh and eighth grade class. So I wanna clarify, make sure I understand. Can, and the can, second can thing is- nuance, um, Can we nuance that, Meg, though? Please. Um, just because right now it sounds super black and white. So uh, yes, in the TK model, these are self-contained teachers. That does not forbid or stop uh, teachers as they do now in our elementary schools, right? They do it now. There's no TK, there's no TK-8 at some of our elementary schools and teachers uh, do take it upon themselves uh, to team up, to switch. Hey, I'll teach math and science. You teach language, arts and social studies. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far as saying black and white, like, if it's a TK, there will be no switching, but- Well, I know, but they're switching at elementary schools now where teachers Correct. team and everything Correct. too. But the teacher of record who gives the grades is gonna be the teacher, they're gonna be in a self-contained and assigned there. And so if the teacher chooses to switch and whatever, that's an if, so there is no guarantee. Correct. But I wanna, I wanna reiterate then what um, Edna said, and, and the reason I'm saying that, and, and I have heard him say this publicly, so I'm not being inappropriate mentioning his name, but Mr. Ussery, who has been a math and science teacher at the TK through eight, or who previously at center was a math teacher, this year for the first time at, at Ellington has had to have a self-contained class because there have not been enough students in order for them to do the switching and stuff. And he's a math and science guy and that's what he's taught for the last 30 years of his career. And now all of a sudden he's thrown into doing all the subjects. That really does do a disservice to the students ha having that kind of um, credentialing issue or whatever else. So okay. I just, I wanna make that clear. And, and can, I, I can, can I address, oh, okay. can I address the credentialing issue? Because there is a, there is a, a provision in education code that allows for uh, a teacher with a multiple subject credential to teach in a uh, core setting. So uh, that would mean that if uh, Mr. Ortega is the um, math and science teacher, he could have uh, different great, uh, different classes of just those same students. So it would be a cohort of students that um, uh, Mr. Ortega would have for um, both math and science, and then he could have another cohort of students for again math and science, and that does not require a science credential, a single science, single subject science credential. I understand uh, that. Teachers Mike. do that with a multiple subject credential, um, and I have been a part of two other uh, K eight schools, and as a, as a assistant principal and principal, where I have uh, we or we have had teachers teach, and what what. The, the a parent would say, oh, that's that's a middle school because they're switching classes, but the teachers were multiple subject teachers. I, I understand that. And we've done that at sixth grade and they've done it at sixth, seventh and eighth grade at Slauson, uh, Ellington, I'm sorry. Um, but in this model of TK through eight, it, it is having self-contained classrooms. And so I just wanted to point out that it is a humongous switch for those teachers, especially too, where they've been teaching, like you said, to you know, math and science, and now as a self-contained, they are gonna be expected to be teaching all the subjects where they haven't been doing that for the last however many years because they've been you know, doing their single subject. I wanted to point that out. Another, another question positive, have is just that, to say, Meg, just another positive, that this is a five-year implementation plan. So it would not be, they'll be self-contained instantly the next physical year again and i want to make sure we're being focused on 
the model, not so much in the weeds of the model, but just the model, we identified that yes, this will have self-contained classrooms. Okay. Um, Dr. Mitchell identified that and we also um, noted it here. So okay. I, I think I don't wanna keep staying on that one target. Okay. And um, I, if, I have a ahead. second question and it's about the elective wheel. Okay. Um, I, I'd like somebody to clarify what the intent of that is going to be or the commitment to that is going to be because the way it has existed in, at Ellington now, um, the elective wheel is entirely up to what the teachers are either qualified to teach or are willing to teach. And so it's not the same as electives, say, at another, you know, at a, at a traditional middle school. So can you clarify what that means, please, or what the intent of that, that is going to mean? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Um, so, so the intent of this particular model is to give, um, is to have the, the TK5 and the TK8 students an opportunity for a broad course of studies. And so giving, having an opportunity for students to um, participate in uh, different choices. But still, I'm asking because I think that this is an important distinction mm -hmm. between doing parents choosing between a TK-8 and say a traditional middle school, knowing that mm -hmm. when we say the elective wheel, it doesn't mean the same kind of electives that are offered at the traditional middle school, like, you know, a class of choir, like where you said, like, Latasha, it was very clear um, on your example that the traditional middle school sixth through eighth grade was going to have a year long elective designated that a child could choose. I just want to understand, I just want to point that out. And so parents understand that that's not the same thing. So anyway, Dana, Dana, what Dana, when you say broad course of study, you are still saying, however, that they're in a self contained classroom and their teacher will be responsible for providing the broad course of study for all of the eighth grade students in their classroom. Yes, that is correct. Yes. And Thank so, you. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. All we have, right. I just throw my two cents in about the elective wheel. So the elective wheel at Ellington has fallen apart because we only have one seventh grade teacher and one eighth grade teacher. So at the beginning of this school year, my daughter who's in seventh grade had the opportunity to do yearbook because we had two seventh grade teacher or two eighth grade teachers and one and a half seventh grade teachers. Anyways, long story short, now there's Mr. Estery and there's Miss Garino. So my daughter doesn't have an elective anymore and they put her in, in remedial English and my daughter's an advanced student. So that whole opportunity to do an elective fell apart. And my concern is if we have a self-contained teacher only teaching eighth grade and that's all they're teaching, is that elective will actually going to be viable? Let me take that one, Dana, or you have it. Well, uh, I mean, I can, what I can respond to is that it, this is, it, it's a model. <clears throat> and so there would, Leslie, to your point, there would certainly be some details, even to, um, to Jen's point as well, there would certainly be some details that we would need to work out. But in this model, the idea would be that the students would have these opportunities. But again, there's, there would be a lot of details to be able to, you know, to put into place. We have a couple of uh, people waiting that have put their names in the chat. So um, Margie, I believe, was next with two questions. Okay. Hi, um, I had a question about the counseling services for the seventh and eighth graders. And um, when I'm looking at this and seeing a half-time counselor outside of the social worker, which is not a counselor, um, I, you know, the recommendation is 250 students per one school counselor. How can you, um, justify having upwards to 749 students per one half-time counselor. That seems like uh, triple the work for the um, and no extra time and for the same pay. So that's a, a concern and a disservice to our students. Margie, can you clarify where you get 749 kids? Well, because it says at 750 enrollment, you can have one full-time counselor. So I'm assuming it's 700 and up to 749. It's a half-time counselor. Okay. 
I see what you're I see your logic there. And I, I guess for me, what I don't want us to do is get caught into that level of the weeds. Um, but I do think that's a great point um, to identify, to ensure. And that was one of the commitments that we said before, that anything that we implement, we're going to make sure it's in one that we can sustain it. It's not just going to be one and done. We could do it this year and the next year we're having this conversation again. Um, but two, we're going to also have to make sure that every model that we're putting in place, including staffing, is aligned based off current contract language or based off current contact or whatever we currently have in place. And as Jorge started in the beginning, that some of the things that we're putting in place will require negotiation. So it's not, this is a proposal, but we can't say it would happen because we have other parties and entities that we have to get in agreement with. Okay, and then I have a question about the arts. Um, our school district is... Um, having a very difficult time keeping middle school and um, choir or not choir, but band teachers that because their programs have been um, decimated due to the sixth grade going back to elementary school. And these, uh, the middle school band teachers specifically, um, were having to cover multiple elementary schools. What will the arts look like? Because we are already seeing the impact of going into the high school programs, you know, you would expect to have a proportional decrease in the participation and activities at the high school, but it is much less than what it, we would expect it to be. Um, just because the skill level of the kids coming from um, our K-8 school, as um, well as because the reduced classes at the middle school going into high school uh, music programs, uh, choir, also um, is having some reduced um, participation because they weren't in choir in middle school because the, um, or a K-8 because the numbers were reduced. So that's an, a, another issue about programmatic concerns besides the content concerns, because mm -hmm. you know, as well as us, because we talk to people that teach at K-8 schools, uh, you know, the priority in content is language, arts and math. It is not the sciences and the history. It is you know, two subjects overriding. So they, um, students are missing out on some major skills once they get to the high school. So there's that feeder issue moving into the high schools. And I think those are one of the things that um, would tie into once we come to an agreement on our consensus on one or two models, and then we could dig into deeper on exactly what do we want offered at each school. Um, like Dana, uh, Dr. Mitchell stated before, it could be that we're going to choose to have a magnet school or we could choose to have a school that have a specialty class. And then we can have those type of conversations. And then we can also poll all of our parents and say, hey, these are the models we're looking at. What type of programs do you think your students and yourselves will be interested in your peers to take, um, take part in? So those are, I think that's a conversation that will come in once we determine a model. And then we talk about those specialty programs and what we actually envision and what we're going to offer. But right now we're just looking at the model of saying, if we had one traditional TK-5, one traditional 6-8, four TK-8s, and two traditional middle, based on our six pieces, are there any other pieces that we need to add to help you all understand this model and the intent of this model? We have additional questions in the chat as well from uh, okay. Jenny and then Patricia next. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, as I'm an elementary school teacher, so um, I spend a lot of time thinking about the TK through eight model. And I, um, there are some things that I would definitely expect to have addressed. And one of them is that even our very largest elementary schools are not large. And so um, one of the reasons I know that some parents have been interested in the TK eight is because they would like to not have middle schoolers move to a high school like a seven through 12 model. But by the same token, I really would like to have um, very well-developed responses to how you plan on modifying um, any elementary campus uh, in order to accommodate an age span of four to 14 years old on one campus. And one option we have is to expand a middle school to make it ac accommodate the younger grade levels versus making an elementary school accommodate the older grade levels. But I see four TK-8s, five TK-8s, and so we don't have that many elementary, uh, we don't have that many middle schools to modify. So some of those would have to go to elementary campuses, and there isn't enough space, 
There isn't enough bathroom space, especially because the two largest um, schools that you seem to be referring to um, also have additional programs with their own physical modifications that are required like SPED, uh, life skills or VI. And so I'm wondering how you're going to really make sure, I mean, developmental, developmentally, should a, should a first grader be using the same bathroom as an eighth grader? Yeah. Should they have the same um, PE facilities? Should they be on the playground or in the in the lunchroom at the same time? How are you going to take care of all of that and so that everybody's children are being able to have an age appropriate and developmentally appropriate experience? And that is a, a honest concern and that is one of the uh, reasons why it would be a phase in approach. Um, and it would take uh, it will take some modernization. It will take some changes. It will take some um, possibly some construction. It will be taking. I know for sure. Like in one of the slides, we show that um, if it was at a school that currently does not have a kinder, we would have to equip that site for that, and that would be a kinder restroom and a classroom, and making sure they have their own facility to play in. So we well, are taking right. that in consideration. Okay, but it's still first through first through eighth grade using the bathrooms. Yes, throughout the campus. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Patricia Sanchez was next. Good evening. Um, thank you for the presentation. I just have a couple of uh, questions. Um, and one of them is in your information you provided with the low enrollment and what it'll look like within X amount of years. Um, is there anything that we may be able to provide that shows how much of that percentage is interdistrict transfers? Um, because if we do look at these models, has it been considered what is tangible to our community to maintain our students and not have such a high rate of interdistrict transfers or students just not even being approved, but not show up first day and we don't know where they go? And um, it's only because if we do choose a model, it looks like it's a five-year plan. And what if we can take uh, uh, some kind of like, um, not control, but some kind of understanding, being able to maintain our enrollment, if it comes from that interdistrict side, uh, that this, these models eventually, if we do choose one, that it will maintain it and we don't have to come back and do this again, because it also affects our community as well as our district. And then finally, um, do we have any statistics that show that any of these models are currently uh, happening throughout our, um, our county and if they are successful and how is it uh, being implemented or like what, um, what Jen said in regard to the restroom or I mean, even lunches, breaks, recess, all those information, uh, I think we would want to know and the community would want to know um, in regard within the slide as well to support it, support the model. Okay, okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next is uh, Melissa Wilson Perkins. Um, I, I think my question sort of leads on from what the previous uh, um, people were saying, just um, all of the three models proposed uh, sort of have five elementary school um, education campuses, what um, level of, of enrollment, projected enrollment for 24, 25 are we, are we looking for? Um, are we looking that, that these, th these five campuses be at, you know, 80% or 100%? Um, my son's at Hodge where um, Hodge has about 27% open seats and it still feels very full. Um, you know, we still have like four different like lunch times and uh, you know, three different Christmas, uh, well, now that we've retained our sixth graders, it'd be like probably three different Christmas um, holiday um, um, uh, performances in the, um, in our very small um, cafe, caf the cafeteria plus gymnasium. So it's called caffeinasium, I guess. Uh, what is the, <laughs> all three of the models include um, just five elementary school sites. What is our, um, projected percentage of um, in enrollment at those sites. And our goal for all our sites for capacity is nothing less than 75%. Anything less than 75% is costing more to operate that campus versus 
if the school was at 75% or more. Uh, thank you. And then the other thing was, um, how can just just for this one model um, for model one, mm -hmm. so it's only one traditional elementary feeding into one middle school, would that be at 75% that one elementary could 75% uh, fill a, a, one of our 1000 plus um, capacity middle schools? Can I can you ask that question a different way so I can understand it? I'm sorry. Um, so we we would uh, most children would be um, contained at their elementary school site uh, till till eighth grade. We only have one elementary school that ends at fifth grade, and mm -hmm. yet still in model one we retain uh, one middle school. So that one middle school thus would mostly be fed by obviously some parents might opt for it, but mostly by the elementary school that phased out at fifth grade. Does that yes. keep us at seventy five percent in that middle yes. school? Yes. Okay. Uh, next in the chat, we had uh, Meg and then Edna. I appreciated you, Latasha, giving the 75% um, kind of data qualifier there about attendance and stuff, because that makes a difference. Um, I know you said that we're getting into the weeds of some of these, you know, specifics about program or, or not. But I think it's really important that we're transparent with, with the community, with the parents, with, with the employees. About, about what these specifics mean. Because if a parent you know, comes in with an attitude of, I prefer this model, but they don't know what that includes, I think that that's unfair to them because then they're getting, it's kind of like um, the mom that was talking about how her child started with yearbook and then couldn't because of changes in staffing and whatever. I think it's important that they understand the difference between having a TK through eight as, as envisioned by the district what that's going to look like because we've never said self-contained classes for example so i just think we need to lay that out I, I don't think it's weeds i think it's important that we're transparent about it but but you said that we were really looking at the models with the, the six different um, pieces of information and trying to make sure we all understood the only budgetary number we got was the seventy thousand dollars which was what it would cost and i think it was like school three once you add that extra counselor i think was what you said so are there no but but as we've gone through this i've heard you say well potentially we're going to have to make um modernization and modifications and things like that what we didn't see those budgetary costs of what those different models would how that would impact Right. And we did not show that because that would and that would for me mean that we've already determined on what schools are the six that will close. And right now we're just determining the model of the option. And then once we agree on the model, then we can say, OK, based on the model, these are the schools that we feel can make this model work. And this is what we would need to do to make it happen. I understand that because of the specifics of size and things like that and the needs for modification. But the reason I asked that question originally in our last meeting is that I know for some people, um, they may look at model, um, I'm going to just go with model two, and just not knowing what that means yet, that only is going to have seven schools. But if you choose model three, or if the group looks and says model three is the best choice, that one has 10 schools. And so therefore, are we not making enough changes in order to be fiscally responsible uh, with our tax paying payers money. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what, that's why I asked that question because if it's significantly different, whereby we're not gonna be able to offer the electives to the kids or whatever, cause we chose a more expensive model. That's why I asked that question last okay, time. And, and what I can, I hope this answers. So again, each model is designed for capacity. So even when we identify the schools to make the model work, it's going to be based off capacity. It would not be based off this program we want to offer. We're going to start with capacity because that's the focus of our reorganization because we currently are not, we have 50% of our facility that's being unoccupied. So we want to now condense our school so that way we can maximize capacity and we can offer more. But first we have that, we want to make sure everyone understands the three type of models that we're envisioning and then once we have a consensus, have that conversation, okay, you guys, is there any other changes to the models, vice versa, have that conversation. And then if we say, you know what, 
we're willing to, and I'm just saying, we're willing to just swallow model one and three. And so then what we would do is we'll take that back and say, okay, in order to make model one or three work, what schools, what can we implement this and maximize capacity? And then we will come back to the group and say, okay, guys, for model one, these are the schools. We'll be maximizing capacity. We can show you what that percentage is. And this is what it will take to make that happen. Then we also say, okay, and these are the programs that we'll have under model one. These will be the specific schools that they will be offered on. Then for model three, the exact same thing. In order to make model three work, these are the schools that we would do it so that we were maximizing capacity. Here are the programs. This is what we'll be implementing. And this is how it would happen. Okay, so what I'm hearing you say is we are going to get those numbers. Yes. Of, of multiple models that we, we narrow it down to, to still make a further educated choice about the fiscal impact. It is my intention that once we have a consensus of the model that we all are agreed, if we come to an agreement of what model we would like us to move forward in, and then that's what we're going to dig in deeper and identify the schools that will um, work best for this program the schools that would help us maximize and meet our 75% um, um, occupancy um, threshold and also meet the facility needs as well as the programs that we want to offer. Do we have to do a 7-Eleven committee again before that no. in order to choose those schools? No. Even though our 7-Eleven committee, because we're going to be closing some, right? So we don't, we don't know at all. No. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, can I ask a clarifying question? because uh, I want to make sure that we're capturing right the the intent here. Um, when you were referring to um, you know making sure that that we're transparent, like you know a TK8 is going to be self-contained, were you referring to the past compared to now or are you referring to like what what was that in reference to? I want to make sure that we're not missing a beat somewhere because in our slides we call it out in this pre we called it out in this presentation, right? We no, you did, you did, you did once in the slide. It was very clear. It wasn't very clear. I I, I noticed it. I'm not saying it wasn't clear. I shouldn't. Can you go back I, to I the noticed, slide, Natasha? Yes, I can. I, I noticed it because as a teacher, I I know what that means, and I just don't know if parents really know what that means. You know, one more back. Because so are you saying that right here we was, okay, right here it says self I'm pointing like you can see it for goodness <laughs> sake. I'm sorry. Um, it says self-contained eighth grade transitioning directly to high school. That is an inference. No, that they're no, going no, no, to be no, go go two bullet three bullets up. Self-contained okay, classes, on. no traditional electives. Self-contained classes, no traditional electives. Got it. Okay. Yeah, no, I was reading below and you're okay. right. It's absolutely there. I just, it, 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 that is a shift though from our past. This mm -hmm. year is the first year at Ellington that they've had self-contained sixth, seventh and eighth grade, you know, you know, compared to the way it was before. And, and so that's new for the parents at Ellington this year. And then we need to make sure parents who've been advocating for a TK through eight understand that that's how it's going to be moving forward but it says it right there you're absolutely right so okay. my 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 bad i just wanted to double check. I, okay. I own it sorry thank you for pointing that out no problem lika any other questions in the chat yes we have uh, edna next and then margie after all right miss edna okay hi uh so this model offers many choices but i did happen to notice that the uh those for those kids that are in the dual immersion program and I'm at the high school, so I'm not quite sure how popular that dual immersion program is. For those parents, in essence, they really don't have any other option other than to go to a K-8 in order to continue in that dual immersion program. And so they'd have to weigh the benefits with all these drawbacks. Um, and is that something that has been considered that they don't have really any option? So you're referring to the six at the, once we get to sixth grade? Yeah, right. So the kids in elementary school are in the dual immersion program, but then when they transferred, they'd have to continue in a TK-8, right? In yeah. order to continue in that program, there'd be, no, there'd be no junior high option for them. And so they'd lose those electives, they'd lose those PE minutes, they'd lose all the other benefits that would, they would go along with attending a traditional um, junior high, right? 
Yeah, and yeah. I just want to be super duper careful. And we push ourselves to do this also, um, Ms. Rogers. So this is not about you. This is about us, right? We want to be we we want to be super careful that what's a benefit to somebody is a drawback to somebody else, right. and what's a drawback to somebody is a benefit to somebody else. So we're trying to put everything out there as much as possible. But to your point, yes, right now the way the model is designed, if you are dual immersion elementary only. Once you get to sixth grade, you will have to decide you want to continue in the program, then you go to the TK-8 to continue in the program, or do you want to go to a 6-8 and get a 6-8 experience, but the program would not be there? Again, that's right now. Remember, this process could change things, right? This process can say, well, wait a minute, why don't we take the dual immersion 6-7-8 and move it to the traditional 6-7-8? So now the, the, the parents are in the TK-8 program, they can go TK-1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then at fifth grade decide, do I want to stay at this TK-8 and drop dual immersion, or do I want to continue with dual immersion and go to the traditional middle school? So there's, it's, it's alive, it's flexible, it's malleable, malleable. This is only the first intent. Once we get to the point where we are moving away from understanding the, the, the model and move into now recommendations, suggestions, ideas. Um, that is definitely something that, again, this is manual, ma malleable, it's not a cement. Okay, thank you, Ms. Marky, what's next? Um, I'd like to back up to the capacity question or issue that was raised. Um, Latasha, you said that the goal is to have 75% capacity or we're losing money, you know, from um, the ADA. My question is then both of the high, the high school, uh, uh, both high schools, with the exception of Gladstone, which is, will, is projected to be 49% of capacity mm -hmm. um, next year, next school year, but then after that, both high schools are projected to be at 50% um, or below capacity. Um, mm -hmm. Why, if that's, if you're looking for that 75%, then why are there two traditional high schools at every model? And so we also put at the bottom that each model can also include one traditional high school. Okay. Diana Rojas is next in the chat. Ms. Diana. Can we go back to the slide on the models, please? Oh, uh, yes, ma'am. So I have two questions. Oh. The first question, um, and excuse my ignorance if I miss this, but how did we um, come about to these three models? Um, and then are these the only three models we're looking at? So to answer the last question first, so these are three models that we committed to bringing, but we also stated that after we present the three models, we're open to say, hey, maybe we want part of model one and part of model two, and then that's what we're gonna come up, or someone may throw out a model four that just is a light bulb moment for all of us. And then we're just gonna have to start all over because that's what we're committed to. But we Perfect. committed to bringing three models to the program, I mean, to the committee, and the three models were designed based off of capacity only. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. And there's no more questions in the chat, but there is a, a comment from um, Melissa and she says DI could be a possible K-8 Magnet Academy. All right, right so I like we, it. We were talking about um, dual immersion parents as a, as a two, um, I have two children in the dual immersion here um, in the school district. I'm just thinking, there's there's a lot of drawbacks with the, the K through eight to make it a magnet or an academy, whether it's arts or language or, or science, that it allows parents to feel better about maybe missing some of those middle school opportunities, um, knowing that they're, that, that they're, there's concentrated studies with um, a, a path they'd already set their children on. Also, I know at Hodge, we have um, two grades um, per for du dual immersion. Um, I'm not sure what it is at the other, uh, um, is it Valleydale? Uh, that um, perhaps consolidating resources at a single school site would also, perhaps we would lose um, people coming from a local site, but we would consolidate um, resources. Good point, thank you. All right, 
So our goal for our next meeting, we will be reviewing model two. And just to reiterate model two, we'll be talking about a TK high school model will be five TKs and two traditional high schools. And again, we're at the same six pieces. We're gonna present the model, how the model will be implemented, the um, possible programma uh, programmatic ooh, drawbacks, the possible programmatic benefits, um, support staff, as well as any budgetary impact, um, impacts that we have that we can foresee at this time. And I will do the same and we will have a commitment to sending you guys a PDF of the presentation prior. So I hope that was helpful. Um, and I appreciate that recommendation of the question that came up last time. So thank you. Natasha, if I may, can I remind everyone um, if we already told them, I'm not even sure, but uh, if we did, just a reminder uh, that uh, these meetings are, are being recorded um, so that people can go back and view these meetings if they so wish to do so. Uh, they are also live, uh, so people can be watching this uh, in, in YouTube or in Zoom in a live manner. And then number three, we have dedicated a web page uh, to the school reorganization. Um, and so that web page has a summary of each meeting, the video for each meeting and the handouts for each meeting. So that, that, is, that is something that we will continue to commit to. Uh, so as soon as we can, we'll summarize this meeting, meeting number two, we'll upload the video, we'll upload the handouts and we'll archive meeting number one. And then we'll just continue to do that so that people can have access uh, to, um, to that. Um, to answer Mech's question, after we go through our three models and we finish that, that's when we're going to have a discussion on any recommendations to models after we have a clear understanding of all the three models. Um, my question kind of had a part two, and I can't type fast enough to ask you, I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, you had said before that um, once we had looked at all the models and then we could give our input, um, but then you were going to go back and decide which schools that potentially could affect and you would come back and give us the budgetary, you know, assessment. But if we're only meeting three more times and next time we do model two and the third time we do model three, then when are we going to have the opportunity to give our suggestions? I really like, for example, I really liked, and I don't remember if it was Leslie Jones, I can't remember, I'm sorry, um, who gave the suggestion about, you know, having a magnet dual immersion school or having, you know, a performing arts K-8 school and having that be a focus and the shining star of our district kind of thing. Well, maybe it was Mrs. Perkins, Miss Perkins, I'm sorry. But in any case, I mean, are we gonna have enough time for that to give that input with four meetings? And um, boss, let me know if I'm over speaking, but um, I'm saying yes, we will. And if that means that we might have to add another meeting um, or that just means that maybe we finish model three sooner and then the second half of that meeting is committed to that. But yes, we will have that time. It will not be one of those like, oh, Mick, sorry, that was meeting four. That won't happen. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think that this is not about trying to finish in the, in the meetings that we have scheduled. Um, and we definitely want to give it uh, the, the correct amount of time. All right, with that, I want to thank everyone. Um, stay safe, stay healthy. And then until our next meeting, we will see you guys. Thank you.